Hello everyone, it's Steve with Aptera Owners Club. Uh, in this video, I wanna talk a little bit about something a little more esoteric. There was a paper published on March 8th of 2023 about uh, room temperature superconductivity. Now, these people um, out of the University of Rochester, they claim to have discovered a nitrogen-doped lutetium hydride with a maximum TC, a critical temperature of 294 Kelvin at 10 kilobar. Okay, so what that means is they found a material that becomes superconducting at 294 Kelvin, which is 21 degrees Celsius, which is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's basically room temperature. So that's like a normal temperature. And at 10 uh, kilobar, that's about 10,000 times atmospheric pressure, which um, is a lot of pressure. It's about 10 times more than the pressure you would find at the bottom of the ocean, um, but is a pressure that's achievable by like a fairly simple bench vise. Um, so it's not ridiculous amounts of pressure. Um, so they are, they are claiming to have found this, and this is really important or could be theoretically important because uh, room temperature superconductivity is something that we've been pursuing for decades because that would um, open up a lot of things. Like one of the things that it would make possible is like maglev trains. Maglev trains um, are not practical because right now most of the superconductors that are um, usable require liquid helium cooling and liquid helium is obviously very uh we're actually we're running out of helium in fact um and it's it's very it's very expensive and hard to get um and all of that's being used by like the large hadron con, uh, collider uses i think like 120 tons of liquid hydrogen a year and um, all the mris use liquid helium so sorry liquid helium not liquid hydrogen they use liquid helium and so it just, it's just not practical to have like transportation systems be using liquid helium. Um, the other thing that it would allow is very, very high power to weight ratio electric motors. Um, if you, you know, like Toshiba was testing um, a two megawatt superconducting motor that is one tenth the mass and size of a conventional motor with the same level of output. Now, you can and and they're super efficient because obviously they have no resistance and so when you have electric motors they use lose a lot of um, power to like eddy currents and resistance and you can make them very efficient so you can make 99 percent efficient electric motors which is why electric cars are much better than gas cars but you have to make the motors quite large um, to have big enough windings and um, gauge copper wire to not lose so much in resistance but if you had a superconducting core, then you could make them much, much smaller for the same amount of um, power output. That would make things like, like so one of the biggest problems with hub motors, like what Aptera is using, is the mass of the motor. And, you, and it ends up being unsprung weight. And so most suspension guys know that unsprung weight is not good. Um, now the mass of the... Uh, motors in the Aptera, I think it's like 40 pounds, which isn't crazy, like 35, 40, 40 pounds. It's not crazy, but if you could make it like three to four pounds, then that would be a total game changer. And it would also be super efficient. The other industry that really likes these very, very high power to weight ratio motors is aviation. And, you know, there's a lot of work on uh, trying to decarbonize air, air, airport transportation because air flight is like really, really carbon intensive. And so if you could find superconducting motors um, in airplanes, then you could make electric airplanes that are much more efficient. They are already trying to do this using um, helium-cooled uh, motors in test beds. But if you could find room temperature, then you know cooling to 70 degrees is much easier than cooling to uh, negative you know, 200 degrees and 70 degrees celsius that's just it's a it's a lot hard harder okay so here's a little video that uh, university of rochester put out about their discovery superconductors are the material which does not have any resistance okay so see that that is a magnet levitating over um this superconducting material and that is a uh, display of what's called the meissner effect the superconducting materials create a magnetic field that repulses 
um, any magnetic field uh, put close to it. So it repels all magnets. This idea of superconductors was discovered way back in 1911. But in all these years, we were always stuck to these very, very, very low temperatures. But then, for the last uh, six, seven years, we start to see the very much like increasing in this transition temperature, going, uh, getting close to the room temperature. But there's a caveat. This happened at very, very high pressures. All right, so that is a, uh, a diamond forge that you're seeing a picture of here. Room temperature, but there's a caveat. This so this is a diamond forge. So they, they have these materials. So you, you can make superconductors, you can make material superconduct by either cooling them down a lot, or there's another class of superconducting material um, called metal hydrides that you can compress with super high pressure and and then you can get uh, it superconducting at much higher temperatures. And this is a, a diamond forge that's creating ridiculous pressures. This is like a million times atmospheric pressure that uh, these things can exert. It's happened at very, very high pressures until now. If we had zero resistance conductors, we could uh, have trains that could be levitated and transit people from one corner of the country to the other with almost no power. Well, I mean, you'd have to still overcome air resistance unless uh, you had a tube system with a vacuum, uh, kind of like the Hyperloop. But yeah, a maglev would be super cool. It would completely change the way electric cars work. Magnetic resonance imaging is quite expensive. That would tremendously change also. Yeah, so MRIs use a superconducting material called niobium titanium, and that uses liquid helium cooling as well. So even fusion could potentially be dramatically changed, our quest for fusion. We sort of imagine that this could be a real revolution in technology. The new discovery is the first time we are demonstrating a material that superconduct at room temperature and near ambient pressure. Before, the pressure was 270 gigapascal. The new discovery, now we are at one gigapascal, from 270 to one gigapascal. We don't need the diamond anime cell now. There are different other ways to mimic this pressures by using strain engineering or very, very various different techniques. So that's why we are very excited that this is now in a region that we can easily access in terms of pressure and in terms of temperature. There are both worldwide implications and certainly implications for our community. We envision the clear possibility of making Rochester a center for everything that is related to superconductivity. Okay, so they're pretty excited about it. Now here is the uh, caveat to all this. This is the same group that published an, a similar article about room temperature um, superconducting in 2008, uh, 2020. And that paper, which was also published in Nature, and for those of you guys that don't know, there are two um, journals in the natural sciences that are the premier journals. One is called Science, right here, and the other is called Nature. And um, this uh, paper was published in Nature, this one right here. This, this, is a, this was published in Nature in March of uh, 2023. And nature and science is like, if you have any major, major discoveries, that's where it gets published. Like, like uh, here we go. This is some of the 10 extraordinary papers that were published in nature in the past 50, 60 years. Like the discovery of quarks, the, the rise and um, manufacture of monoclonal antibodies, which are a lot of the modern drugs are monoclonal antibodies, and uh, human evolution. Uh, carbon nanotubes, graphene, that kind of stuff, discovery of the Arctic and Arctic ozone hole, um, cell differentiation, the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick, when they found the double helix structure of DNA, they published that in Nature. The first exoplanet found around a sun was published in Nature. And then in science, um, you know, things like gravitational lensing, fruit fly genetics, spiral nebulae by Edwin Hubble. So these are the two premier journals. Anyways, they published this group that published uh, this paper, uh, Ranga Diaz's group, they published in Nature in 2020 a, a similar claim, but with higher pressures. That a lot of people thought that um, that 
wasn't true, that they were maybe making up data. And eventually, um, Nature retracted the study. And people are wondering if this new study is also made up data and not true because they haven't been able to replicate these results. Now, the issue is, is that you, it's very hard to replicate results even if you have the technique, but for engineering problems like this, eventually someone has to replicate it. If this is gonna become commercially viable, you have to be able to um, replicate it and um, manufacture this thing. And eventually, that's the beauty of science, is that anything really important will get figured out. Like someone will figure out if this thing works or not. Uh, it's just a matter of time. So if these guys are making this up, it's it, within a few years, we're gonna know for sure. It's kind of like that whole cold fusion thing um, from a decade ago. Um, after, in, a, in about a year or so, people figured out that those guys were full of it. Um, so you can, you can publish obscure things in science and um, be making things up and people won't know the difference. But if anything is of any real consequence, um, people will figure it out. So the history of um, superconductors is that uh, in 1911, they figured out if you cool mercury down to below the temperature of its critical temperature, which is around four degrees Kelvin, all resistance suddenly disappeared. Then they figured out the Meissner effect from it, which is what you saw with the magnet levitating. And then as time went on, they just discovered um, materials that had higher and higher critical temperatures. So this is the niobium titanium, which is used in MRIs now. And then um, I remember in high school, um, we made uh, yttrium barium copper oxide superconductors which were very interesting because they could superconduct at the temperature of liquid nitrogen. And liquid nitrogen is way easier to get than liquid helium. And then they, they talk about, uh, in, this, in this little article, they talk about this metal polyhydrides. And that is the kind of material that they're using here. It is a lutetium which is a rare earth metal, hydride. So it's nitrogen drop lutetium hydride. So what they did is they took this metal, they put a mixture of hydrogen and nitrogen, they put it under immense pressure and then heated it up and baked it, and then they forged it together. And then it became, a, it, it had this weird color change from blue to pink, which is why they called this thing red matter. Um, and then it, according to them, displayed superconducting um, features. So if that is true, hopefully that's going to turn out to be true and people are cautiously optimistic about this um, because of the group that it came from. But if it's true, then soon we may be able to see, I mean, but soon is relative, maybe in 10, 20 years, we may be able to see um, hub motors that are three to four pounds and have 99.9% uh, uh, efficiency and we could see motors in electric airplanes that are highly efficient and things like maglev and, and and things like mri would become much much cheaper all right so anyways i saw this article and i was um pretty uh excited about it um until i found out that this group had a somewhat shady past um, but i still think that they nature took um, and nature is a very well respected journal they know about this group um, they knew about the retraction they had to do earlier uh, last year, and they still decided to publish this paper, which means that they're pretty confident that this is um, the real deal. And they, it underwent peer, peer review, and um, we shall find out if this is the real deal. Now, I imagine this stuff is pretty rare, lutetium. I've never even heard of it before. And so eventually, this is just kind of a proof of concept. This is not the thing that's probably going to end up in any commercial products. but the idea that you can get superconductivity at 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius and at achievable pressures, um, like mechanically achievable pressures, not with some specialized material like a diamond anvil or anything, is um, pretty cool. And it makes things like um, super efficient electric motors, hub motors, a possibility. All right. Um, Hopefully that was interesting to you guys too. I, it was really interesting to me. Thanks for watching. And thanks as always to our supporting members and have a great day, everyone.